I went and I had a conversation with my mom. Why my mom? My mom is a dancer. In fact, she just had a recital three weeks ago, and she is still absolutely fabulous. And when we lived in Alaska, the one thing I didn't realize is there were no arts classes or music classes in the schools. My mom actually and her friends brought the arts to my classmates and to the community, unfunded by any government. And I cannot imagine our community without those experiences. So here we are today to talk about funding for the arts. The other question I asked my mom was, Mom, why did you stop being an artistic director? Why did you decide to become a paralegal instead? Talk about a difference, right? Her number one answer was, the parents. Her number two answer was limited funding. So today, I really want you to think. I want you to listen. We are facing a $50 million shortfall with our budget this year in Arlington. And here to help us work through these things and think about good ways to continue to have the arts in Arlington, we have David Briggs, Karen Vasquez, and Maggie Boland. David Briggs is a partner at Holland and Knight. He is the past commissioner of the Virginia Commission for the Arts and the Arlington Commission for the Arts. He has been busy. He has played an invaluable role in supporting the arts and growing them in our community. Let's give a warm welcome to David. Thank you very much, Kim, and, and it's a pleasure to be back at the Committee of 100, seeing a lot of friends, uh, people, as many of you know, I was chair of the committee in the 50th anniversary, so I look forward to participating in the 60th. The arts, an expense or an investment. I think first we need to think about what the arts are, and it is not a monolithic idea. The arts vary from region of the country to region. It varies within this commonwealth. Being on the Virginia Commission, I thought I knew the arts in Virginia. Going to South Side or the Valley, it's a different world. There are different types of arts delivery programs and different types of things that people call the arts. Crafts, cultural heritage activities, or all the arts. But whatever the arts are in the Commonwealth or in this community, the arts all have a benefit to our community and do provide us with a way to maintain our vitality and provide humanity to the community. The value of the arts. The arts have been used to be civic catalysts, to create relationships among communities. It's been used to preserve cultural legacies. We've used the arts as economic drivers. And finally, we've used them as ad educational assets. Being more specific, beyond the quality of life that the arts can do, they can help foster a community spirit or enhance the um, reputation and appeal of a community. Looking at the specifics, for instance, education. The arts have been, in this very difficult time, a real supplemental element to our school system to help provide arts education to our schools. And we all know from the literature that arts are now becoming part of the STEAM program, not just STEM, providing the kind of creativity that is needed in our environment. Arts also go on uh, in programs that our individual arts organizations in the county do. Educational Theater Network, uh, theater company, excuse me, uh, has been working with our elementary and uh, grade schools. Signature certainly has its signature in the schools program working with our high school students in the county, providing them with the experience to be able to bring their creative spirit forward. We also have economic development. The arts have been very integral in economic development of the county. And throughout the country, you can just look at the Washington Business Journal. Two weeks ago, there was a whole insert on the west coast of Florida and a whole section was based upon what the arts have done for the west coast of Florida. They've been support systems for our uh, seniors programs. They've been support systems for our disabled and mentally challenged. Look at what Bethesda National, um, excuse me, Bethesda Naval and uh, Walter Reed are doing with our Iraq and Afghan war veterans and using music to bring them back into society. We've got the medically challenged uh, programs. Bowen McCauley in this community has had a very successful program working with Parkinson's patients to deal with bringing dance and movement into that. On top of it all, the arts are very strong in tourism. If you go to Southside, Virginia, where the old tobacco and textile uh, industries were dominant, they are gone. 
What's happening is now the arts through the Crooked Trail and others are using monies and really developing the crafts and the arts in that community and really making a difference in the economy of that area and bringing tourism in and with that dollars. We also have the employment opportunities. Arts organizations in this community alone employ a substantial number of our residents and residents of the area. They also have purchases of goods and services within the community. And finally, the arts generate taxes for the community. They provide employment taxes. They're also paying sales and use taxes. They're also paying real estate taxes and also indirectly dealing with meals, entertainment, and hotel taxes. Uh, just in Sherlington alone, what the benefit of Signature has been in Sherlington to provide a tax base is has been well documented. But all of this comes at a cost to the arts organizations. There is no clear funding pattern. I think you'd have to look at the arts as being funded as a patchwork quilt of various com constituent patches, each being a separate funding source, many of them only tied together with the finest of thread and all needing constant repair, maintenance, and oftentimes replacement. There is no certainty in the arts funding. We look at the uh, organizations that in this community alone that are searching constantly for arts support. And that support goes over, over a wide range of sources. One of the principal sources, of course, is earned income. Ticket sales, sales of artwork, sales of goods. But oftentimes, those types of earned income barely support a third of the operating costs of that arts organization. Then you look at the organizations that may be lucky to have a facility. but and maybe they can rent it out. The Arlington Arts Center is a perfect example of a situation where they have a rental opportunity. But you look at the staffing demands to be able to deal with that. You look at the Ill issues about facilities maintenance. We go on to donations from individuals, which requires a lot of support, and probably many of the organizations get their <coughs> most support from. We have sponsorships, contributions from corporations and foundations, but many of those in the current environment are substantially down. And finally, we get to government support. And government support, just like the corporations and the foundations, has been materially down. And in fact, it's rare that more than one-tenth of one percent of any state's budget goes to support of the arts. At the national level, the national endowment, because of the funding situation over the last three years, has materially reduced both its availability of grants funds and matching funds to state arts agencies. The program is both that the NEA has is both a direct grant program and then matching grants for the state arts organizations. Those funds are materially down. In Virginia, the State Arts Commission, when I was on the commission, when I left in 2009, the rate per capita for support of the arts was 82 cents. It is now down to 42 cents. So out of a state budget of $42 billion, the Arts Commission gets $4 million. That is what they're doing to encourage all the arts organizations, and we in Virginia have a substantial amount of arts organizations dealing on shoestrings to provide many of the benefits that are going on. You look at states around us, North Carolina and West Virginia, 62 cents and 72 cents per capita. You look at Maryland, it's over $2.20 per capita. And you go to the District of Columbia, which in 2012 was $7.62, and then through the generosity of the taxpayers of the District of Columbia, it is now $17 per capita. Despite the history of support for the arts um, uh, in, um, in the state, Arlington has also been a very supportive element in the arts as funding. But even with the current budget situations over the last years, the support of the arts is, is down in Arlington. At the high, there were $279,000 worth of grants made available to the community to support our arts organizations. That is now under $200, $200,000, so about 90 cents per capita. There is really no arts organization, however, in the county that through the grants program receives anything more than five to 6%, and most of the larger organizations receive much less than that in the support. But there's one other thing that government funding does for the arts that is important, and it's not just the dollars. It provides for a way to ensure that 
the public interest is satisfied that in the distribution of arts resources throughout the community, there is some leveling so all parts of the communities uh, benefit from the arts that are act activities. Again, going around the Commonwealth, many communities in Southside, there is no government funding whatsoever at the local level. And in fact, there were areas where we as the commission would be willing to match monies and the localities were unwilling to match it. The only thing those arts organizations had to do was try to find local personal donations. Many of them, there weren't many corporate opportunities. It substantially hampered what those organizations to, can do to bring the benefits to the community, supplementing all the other activities. So I'd posit that, in effect, the arts are not a huge expense, but they do provide a material investment to the community. So with that, let me turn it over to our next speaker, who can take it down to the next level of the county, and then down to our final speaker, who can get us into the micro level. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, David. I'm wondering if we get a copy of the st those statistics later. Yeah, so uh, my apologies, my phone might actually start going off in a second because he was under time. My goodness. Um, so next we have Karen Vasquez. Karen is the Director of the Cultural Affairs for Arlington. She's also held positions in Public Relations, Communications, Marketing at Arlington Economic Development at Multi-City and the Chamber Biz. She also speaks a little bit of German, I'm told. <laughs> Not tonight. Not tonight. <laughs> I can say Klingler, that's about it. Please welcome Karen. Thanks, everybody. Um, as Kim said, my name is Karen Vasquez. I'm the Director of Cultural Affairs for Arlington County. Um, it's my first time speaking to the Committee of 100, and so I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all a little bit about the ways in which Arlington, through taxpayer funding, invests in the arts. I'll give you a little bit of background on our cultural affairs organization because, as I said, that's one of the sort of real clear ways in which we invest in the arts. And then I'll talk to you a little bit more about um, what we as a community do by way of arts expenditures, things like that. So Arlington's cultural affairs department was established in 1986 to promote and support arts in Arlington. Soon thereafter, 1990, the county's arts incubator program was established to help grow what was at the time a relatively non-existent, especially professional arts community in Arlington. Now we certainly had our wonderful organizations like the Arlingtones and some of our other groups that were there at that time, but by way of professional theater companies, things like that, there weren't quite as many of those. And so within the, by utilizing existing spaces in new ways, centralizing the use of these spaces and other resources, and by cultivating talent, within its first six years, the Arts Incubator Program grew or arts organizations in Arlington from 11 to 25. Arts events increased over 500% during that same period, uh, from 200 events to 1,300 events, and audiences grew threefold. The Arts Incubator Program has had then a nearly 30-year success story and was the winner of the Ford Foundation and Harvard University's Innovations in American Government Award, the first such award given to a local arts agency. Today, Arlington Cultural Affairs supports over 40 arts organizations with a grant-making budget of about a little under $200,000, as David mentioned. We operate five theaters, a costume shop, and a scene shop. We run administrative offices for arts organizations, and we run Artisphere, which is the newest this region's award-winning and critically acclaimed visual and performing arts center, which provides a variety of both free and ticketed programs five days a week, year-round. We do this with a staff of less than 25 people, and a combined budget, including both Artisphere and Cultural Affairs, of about three million and change. Um, and that does include that, that 200,000 that we mentioned as far as the grants budget was concerned. So two years ago, the Cultural Affairs Organization moved from its home within the Parks and Rec Department over to Arlington's Economic Development Office, where they found me. And this move was no accident. Rather, it was done in recognition of the need to integrate arts into our own economic def development efforts through not only a philosophical approach, in other words, how we're organized, but also through policy objectives and integration into infrastructure. In terms of policy objectives, we view arts as a creative economy driver. 
We create arts experiences that highlight Arlington as a hub for local, regional, national, and international arts. We help foster innovation and discussion of ideas through the creation of new forums that encompass technology, people, and creative spaces. And we work to brand Arlington as a hub for the arts, for culture, and the creative economy. So the integration of arts into our infrastructure is accomplished through public art, which you see all around you in the public realm, as well as the physical spaces that we manage, our theaters, galleries, and our other cultural spaces. These physical spaces provide audiences with opportunities to participate in the arts and also to support local arts organizations and artists with funding, the spaces to perform, and services to assist them. Our Arts Incubator program provides the outlet for funding, spaces, and services. It provides financial grants to arts organizations, as well as the opportunity for Arlington's supported arts groups to perform in its theaters for no charge. Now, we do collect a 10% surcharge on ticket sales, but that charge is still well below what an individual arts organization would have to pay to rent a space or to go perform in one of the larger theaters, especially those found in Washington, D.C. So what do we get out of this investment? In recent years, the arts industry has begun looking at itself through a variety of lenses. Not only does it consider the intrinsic value of the arts, so the lives enhanced, the hearts it moves, the beauty it creates, and the thinking that it changes, but it's also begun to quantify its value in economic terms as well, which helps us understand this return on investment. According to the most recent arts and economic prosperity study that's conducted by Americans for the Arts, the arts are in fact a vital component of our community and they contribute significantly to our economy. In Arlington alone, the arts are a $97 million industry, supporting over 2,500 full-time jobs and generating 7.1 million in state and local revenue. Our local revenue alone near, totals nearly $4 million annually. And it's not just a revenue generator for government. Arts patrons support local businesses, restaurants, hotels, and for some of us, local babysitters as well. <laughs> In addition to the price of a ticket, arts attendees in Arlington, and this is specifically Arlington, spend an average of $23.45 every time they go to an arts event. That's over and above the price of their ticket. Restaurants, transportation, parking, retail, these are a few of the ways that patrons contributed to the economy above and beyond that ticket price. A 2009 study of Signature Theater's contribution to Sherlington found that more than 50% of theater patrons visit a restaurant prior to attending a show. On performance nights, area restaurants experienced increased sales over non-performance nights of between 7 and 20 percent. Now keep in mind, this is 2009 figures, and we all know that Signature has become a fixture in the Sherlington neighborhood for quite some time. And so I would argue that those numbers are probably even more increased. Each performance generates an average of $8,000 in restaurant sales and approximately $4 million annually is generated in Arlington in restaurant and retail sales, the number that I mentioned before. Lastly, the arts are an investment that contributes to the attractiveness of our community as a place to live and maybe even more importantly, a place to work. And now is when you get to hear the economic development part of this. <laughs> Whenever we talk to a business looking to locate in Arlington or discuss why they chose to locate in Arlington, we hear over and over and over again that they do so because they want to go where the talent is. And that means a young, well-educated workforce. That workforce, as we know, can go anywhere. They can live anywhere. And they choose their location based upon the livability of a community. And so definitely that means good transportation, safe streets, a variety of housing. But according to some studies from Gallup and the Knight Foundations, one of the biggest criteria is entertainment and social offerings. That's arts and culture. As a community, we want that talent because businesses will come here to hire that talent. And when we have businesses locating here, they contribute to our local tax base. And that means the share that we, as residents, remain <laughs> stable and relatively low. So what happens when that investment goes away? In FY 2011, and again in 14, like a number of other departments in Arlington, the cultural affairs budget was cut, namely our grants budget. So the Arlington Commission for the Arts, and we have a couple of members um, in the room tonight, conducted a survey of our supported groups that received funding over the last three years to determine how that first round of grants uh, uh, funding cuts and then the second round 
um, directly impacted their organizations and therefore their economic contributions to Arlington County. The survey asked for responses in two primary areas, whether any performances had to be canceled and whether they experienced any negative changes for staff in terms of hiring and pay. What we heard back was that these cult cuts resulted in a variety of losses, both performances and events canceled, salaries cut, and some jobs eliminated entirely. All told, performance cuts meant a decrease in nearly 4,000 patrons over three years. In other words, patrons who would have attended had those performances been held. And using that Americans for the Arts spending estimate for Arlington of $23.45, we can calculate that if these 3,680 patrons had spent that $23.45 on that outing, then over $86,000 was not spent in Arlington County over the last three years. On the jobs front, given the eliminations, downgrades, and hiring freezes, the cuts created $158,000 in lost income and thus lost tax receipts for Arlington. So the bottom line, turns out, is that the grants budgets were cut by about $80,000 during those two rounds. Not a ton of money, but for those individual arts organizations, that was quite significant. And yet, estimated spending due to the canceled performances combined with reduced taxable income paid to Arlington residents totaled nearly $250,000. And this doesn't include any of the charitable contributions or activities that many of these arts groups make that might have also had a negative impact as well. So arts as an investment or an expense. The numbers I've presented, I feel, make a pretty clear argument for viewing the arts, in fact, as an investment and one that provides us both direct and indirect return. But the dollars are really only part of the story. And as David mentioned, there's so much value in terms of the arts. And I would be absolutely remiss as the cultural affairs director if I did not leave you tonight without a thought about the, in the intrinsic value of arts as well. One of the more recent books on the subject, and I have it here tonight in case anyone's interested, is called Counting New Beans. And it actually studies and quantifies the intrinsic value of the arts. And a number of the study participants actually are, are theaters that are located right here in Washington, DC. And so it looks at that intrinsic value, the lives enhanced the hearts moved, the beauty created, and the thinking that's been challenged. And it asks the question, if we make art because we believe it makes better human beings, then why do we spend so much time quantifying economics and so little time quantifying the impact? In short, it calls upon us to find and to count new beans. And here's what it says, and I, I bear with me for a second because it's a little bit long, but it's good. <laughs> Often, we don't choose to analyze our life in general, let alone the artistic experiences, large and small, that filter through it. Tied up in memory or myth or impact or meaning, tied up in the music that we listen to, the theater we see, the dancing we do, the art that bombards our eyes, there is a powerful, strident, necessary truth about the wayfinding power of art. It points you where you want to go, even where you, when you don't know where that is. It nudges you this way and that as, in, as you make yourself. It blinds you with its simplicity and comedic beauty while teaching you a little bit something profound. It catches your heart off guard and blows it wide open. We can know more about that power. We can know more about the consequences of what we do, the impact of what we do, the changes we make in the fabric of our lives. We can measure that transformation. For the sake of the field and the betterment of the people we serve, we need to get started counting some new beans. And we need to teach the people who control funding how to understand the worth of those beans. Because art is not optional, art is life. It changes our rhythms, it connects us to our humanity. It teaches us to live and to love. It makes us smarter, stronger, more coherent. It makes us care and think and innovate. It can indeed transform the way we think and act and live our lives. So I leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Um, our, our final speaker tonight, which I'm very proud to have here today, is Maggie Boland. She is the managing director for Signature Theater. She has also held leadership positions at Arena Stage, which many of you are familiar with. And she has worked on the board of the Broadway Roundtable Theater as the director of annual giving. Please give a warm welcome to Maggie. 
If I had known Karen had such an inspirational quote, I would not have wanted to follow her. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's really, really a pleasure. Um, Signature has been a, a proud part of the Arlington community for going on 25 years. Next year is our 25th anniversary season. I'm a relative latecomer to the Signature family, having only been with the theater for about six years. Um, and in my role as managing director, I oversee the business side of the theater, all of our um, financials and our fundraising and our marketing uh, departments and kind of trying to keep the trains on track while Eric Schaefer, our founding artistic director, uh, he gets to have all the fun. <laughs> so is there anybody here who's never been to Signature? Oh, a couple. Okay, good. So I'm going to give you a little bit of signature history, but not, not too, too much. We can talk later if you want to know more. Um, the theater was founded in 1989 by Eric Schaefer, as I mentioned, and a group of friends who were committed and passionate about the theater and wanted to see a professional theater in Arlington. And what do we mean by professional? We mean a theater in which artists are paid for their work. So in the beginning, the staff were not paid, they were volunteers, but everyone who was in or worked on a show in our early seasons was paid for rehearsals and paid for performances. And that's what set it apart from some of our absolutely extraordinary community theaters, which are still very active in Arlington. Uh, we were one of the first beneficiaries of the incubator program in 1990. So the theater was founded in 1989 and got off the ground with its first season in 1990. And we had three great early seasons in the Gunston Arts Center. After that, Eric and his friends and compatriots just you know recognized that they had outgrown the space that was available to them at Gunston and they really wanted to be able to be a little more in control of their own destiny plan a full season or not around someone else's calendar and have their own space and uh, a lot of people thought Eric had lost his mind when he identified an auto bumper plating facility on four mile run <laughs> as the ideal place for signatures new home um, with the help of a lot of people in the community, and probably, I'm betting, some of you in this room, uh, Eric and the staff and the board of Signature at the time renovated what we now affectionately call the garage oh. into, <laughs> into really a beautiful small theater, a very flexible space um, with a, a reasonably sizable lobby and and okay audience amenities. Um, parking wasn't great, but it felt like a game of Frogger to get across four mile run if you found, you know. But despite limitations of space and size and parking and all that stuff, the theater was making magnificent art in that space. I had the opportunity to see several shows. As an audience member, I got turned away from a whole bunch of shows um, as an audience member. And I think it was a really important time for Signature to refine its Aesthetic. And what we've become known for is producing large-scale musicals in intimate spaces, which means small. <laughs> so um, fast forward from um, the 1993-94 season, which was the first season in the garage, to January 2007, when in partnership with the county, we were able to move into our current space at the end of Campbell Avenue, which was then called South Stafford Street. Um, in Shirlington. And since then, it's been a time of unbelievable growth for the theater. I joined the theater just after they moved in, we moved in to that space. Um, and, you know, we now are a $7 million organization that employs several hundred people every year. Last year, I think we sent out around 350 W-2s, um, and we'll reach about 80,000 audience members this year. So it's been a remarkable 24 years, and we have some great plans for the 25th anniversary season, which hopefully we'll, we'll have a chance to tell you about another time. Throughout the history of the theater, we've been committed to being a great citizen in Arlington, if we could. In 1995, we founded Signature in the Schools, which is a year-round in-school program with Arlington's public high schools. Wakefield High School is our closest partner, but we work with all of the high schools in Arlington. Um, and we are in the classrooms in those schools almost every week of the year. And we have an after-school program um, that is has become a really essential part of who we are 
are as an institution, uh, where students perform an original play that we commission for them every year for an audience of their peers. And we've served over 11,000 students since the founding of that program. Every year we have a free open house um, in the summer, which I hope some of you will join us for uh, when we figure out when it is this summer. Um, but last year about 6,000 people came to Shirlington uh, on one of the hottest days of the year to see free performances all day. It's one of, it's one of our favorite days of the year. Um, perhaps a highlight for us was that in 2009, we were recognized with the Tony Award for Outstanding Regional Theater, which was a giant honor. Something I highly recommend, by the way, is winning a Tony Award, because <laughs> walking out on stage with Eric Schaefer at Radio City to accept that award was truly one of, one of the most spectacular experiences of my life. And Aaron Harms, who's here from our staff with me, can attest we had an amazing experience doing that. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about Signature's economy, since we're talking about um, what, it, what it takes to support an arts organization. And I will tell you a little bit about how we use that support. Um, as I said, we're about a $7.5 million budget. 4.5 million of that budget this year will be spent directly on the shows. And the vast majority of that goes to paying people, which I'll get to a little bit more um, in a moment. About 1.5 million goes to paying our full-time year-round staff. So that's people like me and Aaron, who aren't necessarily working on any one specific show at any specific time, but are there year-round. There's about 40 of us. We have about $600,000 in marketing expenses, expenses, which is what helps us generate the earned revenue side of our budget. The remainder of the budget covers our occupancy, our administrative, uh, education, and fundraising expenses. So by way of an example of how we allocate the resources, did anybody here in the room see our production of Miss Saigon this year, this fall? OK, good. So it was a huge show for us. It was the biggest hit of the year um, so far. Uh, biggest hit of the season and also the most expensive show we'll produce this year. And in total, it cost Signature about $750,000 to produce Miss Saigon. Uh, the way that breaks out is royalties, the orchestra, the actors, um, those numbers together, $110,000 in royalties, so that's paying the authors for the right to do their play, $130,000 for the 16-piece orchestra, $150,000 for the 18-member cast. The rest of the expenses, about $100,000, went toward materials, buying steel, there was a lot of steel in that show, the helicopter, we didn't buy a helicopter. Um, you know, the lumber, the paint, the costumes, the wigs, all of all of that kind of stuff. So of the 750,000, 100,000 went to acquire equipment and things. The rest went to pay human beings to work on the show, on stage, backstage. Um, the show itself brought in for Signature about a million dollars. So that sounds great, right? It sounds like we made $250,000 on Miss Saigon until you factor in the fact that that budget does not include any of our overhead expenses, it doesn't include our marketing expenses, it doesn't include paying me and Aaron, it doesn't include any of the things that keep Signature ticking on an annual basis. So once you start to think about the fact that the biggest hit of our season doesn't come close to covering its own direct costs plus the overhead costs, you understand why we have to raise money. And I will say on the uh, production expenses, most of our personnel costs are dictated by union agreements. Actors, designers, directors, choreographers, we have union agreements, musicians, that's a big one. We have uh, relationships with all of those unions and um, we don't have too much ability to negotiate those expenses down. We certainly could negotiate them up, we don't. We don't have that opportunity. So to talk about David's patchwork quilt a little bit, the, the patchwork quilt of support for Signature, what it looks like right now, um, is this season uh, just under $5 million, if all goes well, will come in from ticket sales and earned, other earned revenue. Other earned revenue is things like our cabaret series, our bar, Allie's Bar, put in a little plug, come have a drink. Um, and if all goes according to plan, that should total just under $5 million. And then contributed revenue will be just under $3 million for the year. Um, about 65% of our contributed revenue will come from individuals this year. 11% from foundations, 
7% from corporations, 3% from government sources, and the rest from our annual Sondheim Award Gala. And the mix of contributed revenue has changed considerably over the theater's history. While individual giving has always been very important, and it's really what got Signature off the ground in the very beginning, um, government and corporate funding used to be make up a much bigger percentage of our total giving every year. Um, I think we're typical in that regard, particularly in Virginia. Uh, at the same time that our budget has tripled, so since we moved in to the Sherlington facility, um, our, you know, our government and corporate support have declined precipitously as a percentage of our total budget. So that's what our contributed income mix looks like right now. Um, what we're working toward as an organization is getting to a place where we make 50% of our revenue from contributions and 50% from ticket sales because that will make us a little less reliant on single tickets, a hit show like Miss Saigon, which can be very, very unpredictable. So that's something the staff, Eric and I, uh, and our board of directors who are incredibly dedicated and generous are working on and working toward and is gonna be a big component of our 25th anniversary fundraising plans, uh, but we're not there yet. So, um, I think I'm. I think I ran out of time. <laughs> okay, so I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. So I'd like to invite our speakers up to the table, please. Uh, if you could please ask a question, and please not a statement. Also, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself before you ask her that question, that'd be great. And we have mics coming around. Uh, we have Lynn in the back with a mic, and John in the middle with a mic. All righty. We have a first question. Yes, Charlie. Yes, thank you, uh, Charlie Clark. Um, I was wondering if, uh, devil's advocate question a little bit, whether you feel during a budget crunch that the arts uh, get pitted against advocates for the homeless or the anti-poverty programs or drug abuse, uh, programs that would be considered by some people more necessities as opposed to luxuries. Um, yeah, the, the, the short answer to that question, I guess, is that um, there are, in a difficult budget season, and we've had some difficult budget seasons in the last few years, there's a lot of difficult choices that, that get made. Um, I think that anyone, at any department, I think, could, could sit up here and say that they feel as though um, they're often in a situation where different um, different services and such are, are sort of at sometimes pitted against each other, even amongst the ones that are considered, I think, by most as sort of core services, police, fire, um, uh, health and human services, things like that. And so I don't necessarily feel as though the arts are the only one that are, are sort of singled out in that way. Um, I think that oftentimes um, the arts are considered a nice to have rather than a have to have. Yet at the same time, I think there's probably other other services as well that other folks would have different opinions on too. So, um, you know, we I think we do our best to advocate for um, what we believe are is appropriate funding for the programs. We try to show the value and the return on, on that spending. Um, and we try to use our funding as wisely as possible to the benefit of most people as possible um, so that we continue to try to do the most good. I, David, you wanna jump in? I would concur. Um, one of the most, um, as a commissioner in the State Commission for the Arts, one of the most amazing things is going to a, a budget hearing for the state legislature and walking into that meeting and seeing the plethora of people there with your hearts just bleed uh, for the disabled, the mentally challenged, the, the food assistance needs, but, and the arts are there but never can be really promoted as well. We have found that with the arts, what you need to do is really push on the, the STEAM concept, just not STEM, working the arts into the science, technology, and math elements to understand that that creates the kind of creativity support for development of a community that then can really fund these other activities. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kim. Uh, Peter Fallon. Um, what uh, we've heard recently about on the budget issue that the schools are also suffering, 
uh, going into the next season. What can the county do to help make sure that there is arts education continued in the school system? I don't know that I'm the, the right person to answer that question. The way that um, the the way that support of the arts in general and funding of the arts in general is administered through the county is that the school's budget manages all of the arts educate all the arts education components, and the county government budget manages. Um, the, the programs and the services that I spoke to you about, about our arts incubator program, Artisphere, and things like that. So it's actually a question for schools, um, and, and I apologize, I, d I don't want to speak for them. Can I just throw out that the work that Signature does with Arlington schools is all provided to those schools free of charge. So um, uh, barring anything catastrophic happening at Signature that would dramatically change our programming in general, our commitment to the, as I said, the sort of year-round presence and, and actually being in the classrooms and providing after-school programming isn't vulnerable right now. Yeah, and I thank you, Maggie. I gave you kind of the government wonky answer to that. Um, <laughs> I would like to add also that a number of our arts organizations um, do a lot of significant, they have a lot of significant involvement in our schools. David mentioned a few. Um, Bowen McCauley is one in particular that has a year-round residency at Kenmore Middle, Middle School and provides <coughs> professional opportunities for kids um, to be exposed to a professional dance company um, and work with professional dancers. Um, especially some of them that are in currently underserved populations. Um, there are countless others, ETC, um, I know Opera Theater, uh, uh, Opera Nova also does significant amounts of work with the kids here. And so although um, a, from a budgetary standpoint, the school's budget covers the, the in-school education related to the arts. We have so many arts organizations that really have significant involvement and give back in very significant ways to kids here in Arlington. Who did I have next in the back? Yes. Hi, I'm Gail Dennis. As you can see, I'm a senior. And I would like to know what, uh, have the three of you address what the arts community is actually doing to get seniors involved in the art community. I know if I go to the Kennedy Center, I can get half price tickets. I don't have to qualify economically. I just have to be a certain age and have survived that long. Um, and I know that when budgets are allocated in Arlington, the first, th the first thing that they want to cut is the senior centers and the sex next thing is the arts budget. Maybe personnel is a third. Um, and I would like to know what you all are doing to try to, to get us involved, other than perhaps performing occasionally in one of the senior centers. Well, I think that um, one of the really great ways that um, many of our seniors get involved is, is through patronage of our arts organizations that are here. I think that we have such a, a varied offering of performances and exhibits that um, there really is something for everyone and I don't think as a as a county entity we would want to be in the business of sort of price setting for ticket prices and things like that for individual arts organizations I think that those organizations know best what their budgets can bear and um, what their audiences are looking for um, so from that aspect, we really do rely on the organizations themselves to know their audiences and deliver performances um, and, and at price points that make sense to bring in those particular audiences. Now, I'll also do another, uh, another sort of shout out to Bowen McCauley. Um, I was on their board actually before um, I became the cultural affairs director, so I know a lot about them firsthand. Um, they, in particular, run a marvelous program for um, individuals with Parkinson's disease, and they provide classes for free and performance opportunities for free for those that, for individuals who are living with Parkinson's. Um, a group of, of those uh, seniors were able to perform at the Kennedy Center about a year ago, I think it was, um, and it just, it brought the house down. It was, it was such a tremendous thing to see. Um, so I, again, I, I really think we do rely on all of our marvelous arts organizations to be able to make as many programs and performances as accessible as possible. I think the other thing that is important is the volunteer opportunities for the seniors. 
The arts organizations, as Maggie has noted, are very thinly staffed. So I think without many of the seniors, you would have a very difficult time seating audience members. Many of your um, uh, ushers are, are, are seniors like myself. Uh, and I do qualify. Uh, but, uh, I, and, and many of the uh, smaller arts organizations are desperate for volunteer opportunities to, to do the smallest things, to keep them going, because they are running on such a thin budget opportunity. There's no question that um, cultivating a, an audience of seniors is really important to us. We don't have any age-related discounts at the theater that are sort of available on a standing basis. We do have a student discount, but that is not age-specific. You could be a student of any age and take advantage of that. Um, and I think you know one of the big questions facing our field is how to build our audience for the future. That doesn't just mean young people. That means how do we sustain the audience that we have, and um, and how do we how do we satisfy our need to continue to bring in new people to the theater every single year in order just to survive. So there's no question that every single constituency is incredibly valuable to Signature. I will say we do have an extremely robust attendance from seniors at the theater. We're very proud of that. Um, we try to make a lot of uh, services available, you know, large print programs, assisted listening devices in case that's of value to anyone. Of course, our spaces are accessible um, to the handicapped if that's, again, necessary for anyone of any age. Um, but we don't have a specific program directed at seniors. So, uh, but my question right now, who's in charge? You know, I, 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 I mean, all of you are not, you know, very informed, very nice people, but I don't, I'm looking for like the notch bishop, you know, someone who says, uh, you know, um, we really would like to have a poet laureate. We, 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 that would elevate our, our community. Someone who's out there, uh, not a processor, not just looking at the economics, but it can at least pat people like David and me on the back and say, we know you don't bring in any money, but we really like having you here. I, I think that's Maggie. I think yeah. I'm going to nominate her. How about that? <laughs> well, I will say we've had the opportunity, Eric and I, to get to know the county manager pretty well over the, the time that we've been in the Sherlington facility. Because it is a county-owned facility, she's our landlord, ultimately. Karen is first, comes in first in line. But, and, um, and I will say that Barbara Dunallen is a gigantic advocate for the arts yeah. and a really strong supporter of arts groups of all sizes. So I think um, we really do have leadership in the county that supports the arts. It may not always be possible for her to lead decision making, you know, right down the road we want it to go based on all the other factors we've discussed. But um, I feel very optimistic having Barbara as the, the county manager in terms of our ability to at least hang on by our fingernails for, you know, for the arts in Arlington, if not make real progress. I'm Jean Hedges. And I have a sort of specific question. It's not very well, I don't know if you can answer. Uh, the Arlington Arts Center is very near me. In fact, my children went to school there at Maury. Wow. Right. And I was uh, a, a supporter of it from the very beginning. But I have uh, at least two or three friends who have not found any art there except modern art. Mm -hmm. Now, you may not be able to answer this question, but is there someone in charge of that particular uh, art center who is promoting nothing but modern art that's all I've seen there yeah no I, I can help answer that question um, Stephanie so I'll give you the name for the executive director of the Arlington Art Center is um, a wonderful person by the name of Stephanie Fedor Stephanie yes and um, she's the executive director um, the Arlington Arts Center is an organization that is focused on contemporary art um, and they pull in not only regional but also national and quite a number of international artists as well. And so that's really how they have built their reputation. That's their, their mission and vision. Um, and it doesn't mean that, that they don't do some other things as well. Um, but you are right that it is primarily, what you will find there is primarily contemporary art. Um, and. It, they've, they've found a lot of success with that. Um, I think that, that in general, if you go out sort of in the world and look at uh, different arts and cultural centers, that all of them 
find the most success when they can have a specific vision and mission for what it is they do um, and, and have a specialty because there is just so much, especially in the realm of visual arts, that can be included that in order to have a facility that that brings in people and sort of gives them you know what 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 they expect in some regards um, you need to have you need to be very clear about what that vision and mission is and and adhere to it as closely as possible so i would say that the arlington arts center is no different along those lines and Jean, real quick, I am on the board of the Arlington Arts Center. Okay. Stephanie was hoping to join us this evening, but she wasn't able to make it. There are some cards on your table if you have any interest in Arlington Arts Center. And Jean, we are looking for board members, so we should probably chat. George Hobart, uh, this is another question for, for you, Karen. Uh, can you explain uh, what's going to happen at Kenmore on the afternoon of April 26th? <laughs> I suspect there's a tremendous performance there by the Arlingtones. <laughs> Did I get that right? <laughs> uh, no, uh, uh, I believe this was uh, a county arts festival from oh. noon to four. Yes, yes, yes. It's the Move Me Festival. And are the, Arlington, are the Arlingtones going to be there? Good, good. Oh, no, that's terrific. No, it's the it's it's called the Move Me Festival, and it's it's sponsored by Bone Macaulay Dance, but it gives an, it brings in a variety, a huge variety of different arts organizations, um, music, performance, dance, all opera, all sorts of different organizations in Arlington. It's family friendly. It's free. It's it's such a great great experience, and I give so much credit to Bone Macaulay for sort of initiating that and then all of the really great arts organizations that participate because that was something that they took upon themselves they built they created it they built it they they didn't ask for any help from county government or anybody else they just took it on and ran with it and I think that's such a tremendous thing for them to do outside over and above all of the other programming and performances and all the things that they have to do related to keeping their organizations alive and kicking. So um, I really definitely encourage you to go out, bring families, go check it out. It's it's a really terrific show. My name is Carl Van Newkirk, and this is a question for Karen and David. Uh, and I'm not thinking of anything at the local level, but we've certainly seen it at the national level. And that is that some art is controversial, uh, objectionable, um, or perhaps even obscene. And what do you think of the appropriateness of using taxpayer money for such kinds of work? It's, it's a very good question, and it's a question that, that was asked nearly 30 years ago when we began our arts incubator program. It was asked by Signature. Right. Yes. The, the very first show in Signature's history included nudity, and I, I was just reading this section, Millfire. Yes. Yeah, and, and Eric went to the county to ask right. if there were going to be any restrictions placed on the content right. of signature seasons at Gunston, and the answer yes. was no. And no. the answer was no, exactly. And the policy, and the, policy the policy does does is is is, is outlined that the county provides. Uh, some funding, some spaces, and some services, and then basically gets out of the way and allows arts organizations to do the work that they do best and allows audiences to make decisions about what they find appropriate and what they do not. And they can they vote with their pocketbooks, basically. So. And I can tell you, having served on both the Arlington Commission for the Arts and then the Virginia Commission for the Arts, okay. our whole grants program was is, is focused around um, evaluation of the presentations made by the applicants for funds. We try in each of those instances to make sure we are reaching the broadest segments of our population to ensure that there is no specific set of organizations or individuals being served by the dollars. We again, however, were very aware of and uh, I can certainly say some of my c fellow commissioners, at, certainly at the state level from other parts of the state, were more concerned about some of the matters you've identified than some of the rest of us. But we all came forward with the idea that we needed to be as broad and, and non-involved in the, the nature of the uh, presentation so long as they were 
fine quality, high quality artistic ventures. And that was the critical thing, to provide as much diversity, but doing it at as high level as possible and try to do that through our direction of arts funding. I wonder if you would comment further on the current status of the artist sphere. I know there are a great many of us who are really rooting for it to succeed, and yet, initially, it was not economically successful. Thanks for asking that question. Um, artist sphere, you're right, uh, had a little bit of a rocky start, um, to put it mildly. When we opened um, on the um, auspicious date of 10 10 10, um, we probably weren't 100% ready for prime time, as, as the saying goes. Um, we wanted to get it open, we wanted to, um, to, to, to move forward as quickly as possible. Um, but there were a lot of things that were not quite ready. We didn't even have an executive director at that point, Jose Ortiz. He came about six months later. Um, and so very early on, um, we realized that there were a lot of um, forecasts and predictions about Artisphere, not only related to the numbers of patrons that it could could see, but also um, the financial pieces of it that were probably not realistic. Um, like any new organization, we also didn't know what we didn't know at the time when things were getting put together, and there were um, operating expenses and those types of things that um, were not uh, that were greater than what was originally estimated. And so we took a step back and and we we retooled and we um, developed a new business plan and we refocused. And since then, um, with the last couple of years now, um, our visitorship has increased. We have increased our revenues significantly. Um, we've achieved quite a lot of critical acclaim. Um, we have, uh, in just this past, as a matter of fact, in this past Washington Post Spring Arts Preview, um, an upcoming show at Artisphere Fermata was picked as the, num the, the top pick for the Washington, D.C. region. Um, we are not a, a, an exhibit goes in and out of there without getting some kinds of positive reviews from a variety of different outlets. We've partnered very successfully with a number of other organizations, a lot of embassies in D.C. Um, to not only um, to increase our reach to their audiences, but to bring more people into Artisphere and into Arlington. So. While we did have a bit of a bumpy start, um, I think that the path ahead for Artisphere is a good one, and um, we are definitely on the upswing, and I think that you'll continue to see more positive news about Artisphere and more good things coming out of that organization. I want to briefly give you all an opportunity to make some many final remarks, final requests to our members and our guests. You know I can't help it. Come see Beaches at Signature. <laughs> um, I did bring a stack of our season brochures that are on the table as you're walking out if you don't already have one. Please pick one up. We still have half of our season ahead of us. We're going to be announcing our 25th anniversary season on or around March 10th, if all goes well. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And, and really, thank you for this, this amazing opportunity. We're very, Signature's very proud to be here tonight. And I'll put in a plug. Um, both for the state level and the county level as far as advocacy for the arts. The state level, the legislature has before it two, uh, a, a budget amendment that would provide for an additional $250,000 for grants funding for this fiscal year and then a second $250,000 for next fiscal year. This is the first time we have had bipartisan support for these budget amendments to the governors. So we're hoping that with uh, uh, support from the community that that time some money as i said we dropped from 85 cents per capita to 45 and it has hurt many arts organizations signature alone went from state support of just a little about 120,000 down to less than 70 and that kind of drop is 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 material to the way they go the same thing with the county we're entering budget cycle if you think the arts are providing the kind of benefits to the community, both direct and indirect, it's always worth talking to the county board members about the importance of the arts as part of that budget funding. Mm 
Thank you. Thank you to the Committee of 100 for inviting me out and for allowing me to talk with both uh, alongside of uh, uh, David and Maggie. Um, in terms of, of what you can do as, as individuals, I would ask you to continue to be patrons of the arts. That's the best way that you can support our arts organizations and arts in general in Arlington. Um, the National Endowment of the Arts recently did a study that showed that arts patronage across the country is decreasing. And with one of the exceptions is here in Arlington in the Washington DC region, our patronage is actually increasing. We are bucking the trend here. And I think that that's something we can be really proud of. So keep up the good work, <laughs> continue to support our organizations. Um, and I hope to see you out at an upcoming show. Thank you.